Time now for Morning Rounds, our look at the top medical news of the week. Joining us are CBS News Chief Medical Correspondent Dr. John LaPook and CBS News contributor Dr. Holly Phillips. First up this morning, a remarkable story of a do-it-yourself bionic hand. Michelle Miller reports on a boy and his father who turned a dream into reality. Grabbing a backpack is hardly the feat of a superhero. Unless you're 12-year-old Leon McCarthy, and your hand looks like it's straight out of a science fiction movie. You've actually become sort of a cyborg. There's a cool factor. Yeah, it's like a, a special. It's special instead of different. Leon has been special since birth. While he was still in the womb, restricted blood flow prevented his hand from developing. I saw his hand sticking up and there were no fingers on it. It was hard for my wife. It was hard for me. Two years ago, Leon's father, Paul, began the search for an inexpensive, functional prosthetic. He found this internet video posted by Ivan Owen, an inventor in Washington state. I've always had this vision of people being able to build their own prosthetic device at home. Owen and a collaborator in South Africa designed a mechanical hand that could be made by a three-dimensional printer. It's essentially like a hot glue gun. It's a plastic that feeds into it. The printer head gets really hot, it liquefies that plastic, and then layer by layer creates an object. The design relies on wrist movement. Downward motion creates cable tension that closes the fingers while a move upward opens them. The assembly instructions were posted for free on the internet, so someone like Paul McCarthy in Marblehead, Massachusetts could print it. He took the idea to his son. I thought he was a little crazy. He was like, we can print all these fingers and then like, clip them all in and it was a little too much. The first time you saw it and when you tried it out. It was pretty awesome. Making your kids happy is like the most rewarding thing you can have as a dad. What an amazing dad. John, I have to ask, how much would that hand cost though? Well, the materials cost only five to 10 bucks. The printer costs about $2,500, but it was paid for by the school. And so it's cheap enough. He's, he's on his fourth version soon, and he calls it the cyborg hand. Wow, so John, what happens next? Very interesting. I spoke to the dad, and he said that the next thing is that Leon is teaching other kids in the school, as part of a school project, how to design and make these. And their plan is to design them for kids locally, right. be able to give them to them, and then eventually go internationally. So really, it's, it starts off as something for him, but it's becoming a big community project. Such so a great idea. All right, two studies this week had good news about the benefits of getting some exercise around the house. The British Journal of Sports Medicine says gardening or doing household repairs can cut the risk of heart attack and stroke by 30% in people over 60. And a report in the American Journal of Preventative Medicine says that even 20 to 30 minutes a day of walking or gardening can help prevent depression in all age groups. Researchers at Cornell University reported this week that families who sit down to the dinner table together with no TV have lower rates of obesity. What's more, the study also found that when families eat anywhere except the kitchen or dining room, both parents and kids have a higher risk of weight problems. John, what's the dynamic here at the dinner table that, that changes this whole equation? I think that you're, you're talking to each other, you're engaging, and you're eating mindfully as opposed to the mindless eating that you do in front of a television set where you just sort of just shovel it in, you're not even thinking. And Brian Wansink was one of the people who did this research did a terrific experiment in the past where he took Pringles <laughs> and every seventh Pringle he made a red chip. Right. And he found that people had, because that, that sort of made that there was an apportion. Yep. They had half the Pringles when they had a portion. So it's this idea of getting rid of mindless eating, which we do all the time. So it, this, this is, I love this because this is something you can do, doesn't cost any money, sit around the dinner table, not so bad, have a conversation with your family, and guess what? Your weight may go down. I have a one and a half year old, so this is hard in my house. I'm trying to say <laughs> sit still and listen to us talk. But do you both, as physicians, do you guys do this at home with your kids? Yeah, I, you know, I try to as much as I can. I also have very young kids. They're two and four. But I do want them to get the sense that mealtime isn't just about you know, putting the food on your plate in your body. It's really a social time. It's time to talk and enjoy, you know, each other's company. And I also, if they're going to have a snack afterwards, or if they're going to eat anywhere that's not at the dining room table, I try and limit it to fruit or something really healthy. I say, okay, if you want a snack while you're doing this, 
there's your grapes. And so, and, you know, I think that makes a difference. That's very smart. Finally, this week, it was just over a year ago that Superstorm Sandy forced the evacuation of NYU Langone Medical Center in Lower Manhattan. John was at the hospital that night when an amazing rescue took place. Hey, Jack. Jackson. Joanne Tremblay Shepard and her newborn son, Jackson, were on the ninth floor when the storm hit Manhattan. Jackson was born prematurely at 27 weeks and for two months had relied on machines to help keep him alive. We saw some flickering at some point, so I think that's when the generator um, basically kicked in. But um, shortly after that, the power went off completely and all of the monitors, everything just went. The lights went out. Respirators stopped pumping. So doctors and nurses launched the complex evacuation of 20 fragile newborns down nine flights of stairs. Jackson was the last one out. With the help of a flashlight, a nurse carefully carried Jackson and his oxygen tank down the stairs. Joanne and Jackson were helped into an ambulance by the nurse. Her name, Sandy. One vicious Sandy and one gentle, loving Sandy exactly. in the same night. Yeah, I've got her down as hero in my phone. <laughs> Jackson was taken to a nearby hospital for a few more weeks before going home. He was all right, didn't he? Yeah. Nobody? A year later, the shepherds are weathering happier challenges. Good job. 14-month-old Jackson took his first steps last week. Hello. <laughs> so, so sweet. It's what a really miraculous good. evening I was there. I still cannot believe it. It's been a year. There were no deaths. We used the word miracle, no deaths that night. And there was a little bit of a surprise, which was that the family now has two-month-old Roxanne, Wow. Born at NYU Langone Medical Center, I said, did you have any misgivings about maybe going back to the same <laughs> hospital? They said, absolutely not, but we did check the weather report. <laughs> it was sunny. <laughs> Great story. Dr. Great John LePook, Dr. Holly Phillips, thank you.